Can you tell us about your academic career? Uh, a bit checkered, <laughs> but uh, I was a, I went to college at Caltech, and I, at the end of my third year, I got thrown out for um, lack of academic ability, uh -huh. and I was also caught picking locks, <laughs> so it was a bit of. Uh, and also I found Caltech, I don't know if you've ever been there, is actually quite a provincial place. Pasadena is archetypal um, provincial America, one would have to describe it as. And so I went to work for a year and then I went to Berkeley. And mm -hmm. I found Berkeley much more interesting, as you can imagine, this was 1960. Ah. And, uh, there was lots going on, and and then I got married, and I had a, a flat just off Telegraph Avenue. No, you didn't. No, you may not. No, yeah. because yes, you had an apartment off an of Telegraph. An apartment, okay. You exactly. were an American. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, you've been out of the country far too long. Right, 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 <laughs> right. Well, when I got to England, I actually corresponded with and I am acknowledged as a consultant on a bilingual dictionary, American, British, British, American. And uh, I get frequently accused of being English, but in fact I am 100% American. Yes. And uh, although I've been living in London since 1970. Fair enough. Now, your math oh. background did not start out in, in recreational topics, but clearly no. You, grad, you you went over, and was that a gradual uh, transition, or was there something more dramatic? It was um, a bit, I have, I, when I was at Caltech, I had gone there thinking I wanted to be a civil engineer. Yes. And then I thought I wanted to be an organic chemist, because I loved all those formulae, pictures mm -hmm. of organic molecules. But when I went to Berkeley, I found that I didn't like physics lab. And uh, then I met through a housemate, a guy named Rick Studehauer, who had a good friend named John Brillhart, who was one of Lamer's students. And was, they wrote a program to do polyomino puzzles, which it was one of the first that did the there were one or two others about the same time. And I was reading books on number theory and so on. And the, I started taking more mathematics courses to do a joint mathematics physics major. And I, was, oh, I took set theory and algebra and number theory, and I thought to myself, why, why have they been hiding these from us? You know, <laughs> they should be teaching this in high school. And in my number theory course, I, which was taught by D. H. Lamer, mm -hmm. and Whoa. good man, yes, and he gave a problem, and I solved the problem, which is how many ways can you write a number as a sum of consecutive numbers? and it has a very elegant solution. Uh, it's the number of odd divisors. And I think that's the right thing. Anyway, the, yes. um, I won the prize, which was a copy of the textbook, and I still have it, and I treasure it. And I did some other things, um, and by the time I got into graduate school, I which I got into simply because Lamer had forgotten to write my, a recommendation and the guy, the graduate advisor, was wondering why I should, they should let me in. And he went down and asked Lamer and said, must take him in, he's the best man in the class, and that's a, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I got into graduate school and by the time I'd finished graduate school, I had written three papers, which is, and one had even been published already, maybe the second one. And um, the first one was I'm still very fond of, 
is on round pegs and square holes versus ah. square pegs and round holes. <laughs> and I never knew which way the phrase went. And I demonstrated that a round peg fits better in a square hole <laughs> than a square peg fits in a round hole up through dimension seven. And then it changes. Really? And John Kelly, who was my, had taught a course in set theory I had been in, was intrigued. He said, well, there must be a dimension between seven and eight where they're equal the two ratios, and I said, yes, there must be, and uh, I got somebody who knew a lot more about calculation than I did, because you needed to values of the gamma function. It, 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 and it comes out some dimension like 7.56 or something like that. Okay. And uh, I had known enough about n-dimensional geometry to know the volume of an n-dimensional sphere, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to compute the gamma function easily, which is a bit of, not not too trivial. Well, in those days, we had books of, books tables, of gamma functions. Yes, we had, so the, I would look things up with tables, but it didn't, uh, wasn't very accurate. And I got a correspondent wrote in from somebody who had a calculator programmable calculator, which he had set up to compute number theory functions, and he did it for, to me for 12 places or something like that. Um, and then I went to teach in the Middle East. Anyway, this friend of, uh, friend of friends told me about problems, and I did some fiddling with things, and I rediscovered Chebyshev polynomials, which is the sort of thing that uh, every beginning student in this subject comes up with at some mm -hmm. point, as Sterling numbers, Sterling po functions, polynomials. You fo when you're first exploring this subject, you keep finding these basic ideas over and over again that have been done many times. But that's, so I did puzzle problems, problems in the Fibonacci Quarterly, American Math Monthly, Mathematics Magazine, etc., and that I could figure out how to do, which, um, and slowly I began to be more interested in puzzles and I wrote an article on puzzles from the Greek anthology, ah. which is an obscure collection of poems and alg of uh, aphorisms and riddles in Greek, which includes a set of about 40 simple puzzle problems. Yes. Like, uh, I'm trying to remember if this is in the Greek anthology, but there's an ass and a mule crossing a bridge, and. The ass says, if I had one of your sacks, I would have twice as many as you. <laughs> and the other says, and if I had one of your sacks, I would have as many as you. And you work this out. And mm -hmm. um, later, I, when I looked at this as a puzzle later on, I realized that the original problem is, in a sense, incomplete. There is, and many of these older problems have solutions, but they don't ask the question, is this the only solution? Are there other solutions with integers, etc.? And so you could take in almost any one of these problems and make it into a whole bunch of problems, which can sometimes be quite interesting. Well, let me say that first. I've written an article about the word puzzles in the Greek anthology. Ah. Yes. So I, I approached it from the other side for my word puzzle friends. Yes. Yeah. Secondly, though, I think you've answered my next question. At what point did you switch from the mathematics of puzzles to the history of puzzles? Uh, sort of continuously from that when I got to England and I was sort of settled and writing stuff, I, whenever I found a problem and I was reading books by 
well, of course, Dudeney and Lloyd, and they sometimes would refer to the history of the puzzles, but usually only very cryptically. But one book I found quite interesting was Tom O'Byrne's Puzzles and Paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And in that, he refers to the Greek anthology. He refers to Alcuin of York's um, Propositions to Sharpen the Young. <laughs> and I extracted this. This is, To find this, you have to go to the theology section of your library, <laughs> to the Patrologia Latina. And there are two versions of it, one attributed to the Venerable, or now Saint Bede, and the other to Alcuin of York. And I photocopied them, and I looked at them, and I wrote, and the Alcuin thing, which dates from about 800, includes river crossing problems. And these are the earliest known appearances of the standard river crossing problems. The man with the wolf and the goat and the cabbages, the three jealous couples, and the getting an army across a river where you have a boat that will hold two kids but one adult. And so these three classic styles of problems appear in Alcuin. And this leads to the question, where did he get them from? Yes. And we haven't the faintest idea. There was no sense that they were original to him. No, there's certainly, and he only just gives answers very cryptically. So he doesn't really explain what he's doing. But in two things, in one of the problems he gives, he says there is an oriental merchant who goes to market with a hundred dinars or whatever, and camels cost five, and horses cost three, and mules cost uh, three for one, and he gets a hundred animals for a hundred dinars. How many did he buy? And this is, I think, the first appearance in the West of this hundred fowls problem, which appears in China in the fourth century. And this, when you start discovering, ooh, this, wait a second, where, where did that come from? And how did this get from, you know, fourth century China to ninth century Europe? Uh, and, but then you discover things like, um, the court of Charlemagne, which Alcuin was ba based in, uh, had connections with Cordova, Istanbul, um, even Baghdad. And indeed, Harun al-Rashid sent a white elephant from Baghdad to Aachen. And it got there and was quite famous. And I wondered at the time whether this was remembered. And when I went to give a talk in Aachen about the, uh, the problems of Alcuin, I went and got there, packed, un, you know, put my bag in my room, went out and walked down the street looking for a bookstore. I walked into a bookstore and there in the entranceway was a pallet full of a little book called Abu al Abbas, the white elephant of the court of Charlemagne, <laughs> a child's book, which was being sold by the thousands. So they still remembered it. And Char uh, Alcuin would have seen camels mm -hmm. in his trips to Rome. They might even have gotten as far north as, um, as Aachen, I don't know, but it's, you realize there was more interaction going on in the Middle Ages than we tend to think of. I mean, um, and therefore an exchange of ideas. An exchange of ideas and these problems, many of them must have come from the Arabic world. And I've got some books in Persian, which I can't read yet, which were first published in the 11th century, and they're still available in Tehran, where the correspondent kindly got me copies. But I haven't yet been able to s decide to master the reading Persian. But Persian is interesting because the language has not changed much. 
Your collection that I'm, I'm aware of um, is historical in the sense that for a given problem you trace its heritage. Right. But it seems to me that how can you do that? It seems to me you have to just be a vacuum cleaner and find everything yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, then yeah. arrange it into right, categories. Right, right. That's what I've been doing and I, you know, I read stuff at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in London and the British Library and University College, etc. London is a great place if you want to do research because <laughs> yes. you have all this access to these wonderful collections. Do you have help? Or are you out there by yourself? I'm pretty much by myself, but I do correspond with people, but it takes effort to do that. Have you considered starting a society for the history of recreational Yes, mathematics? why not? Yes, okay, right. Anybody who wants to join, come well, see me. I think you might have some takers. Yeah, you right. should. You right. should make well, I've, I've, I'm desperate for um, assistance in some ways because I've compiled all my data, this history and historical information, in a now antique word processor. Yes. I can translate from that into Word, yes. but in the process it loses most of the mathematical symbols, mm -hmm. it loses Russian characters, it loses accents, uh, it's generally, you then have to go through the result with a fine tooth comb and yes. repair it, which takes me a long time. I used to give it out at the, these gatherings on a CD, but I haven't had time to do it again for 10 years now. The effort to follow these things back through time, um, is it your goal? Is there any goal to this, or is it? Well, no, but I must say that I am sufficiently conceited to compare this collection that I've been doing, Sources in Recreational Mathematics, with Dixon's History of the Theory of Numbers, mm -hmm. which if you read, I don't know, Kenneth May or somebody like that writing about Dixon said it was the only way proper way to do the history of a mathematical subject, which was to do it in chronological order subject and subject order, subject classifications. And um, I've, I've referred to my Dixon quite regularly. <laughs> Did you have any interaction with a person who had influence on Martin Gardner, and that was Jacuthiel Ginsburg? No, no. Not, not I, I know who you mean, but uh, I have, I had a book dealer in London who knew of my interests, and he was, had interest in mathematics, but when anything came up that was sort of in interest, he would let me know, and he had a set of Scripta Mathematica, yes. which was one of the things Ginsburg was involved with, and I have almost complete set of Scripta Mathematica and other journals of that sort, like Recreational Mathematics Magazine. I have a bound set, which is, and I have most of Eureka, which was the journal that Krajic ran. Eureka, I thought that was the undergraduate journal. Yeah, no, this is going back even further, 1920s. I see. And he, in it, I think that's the right name, um, yeah, I think that, okay. and he, um, that was Krejcik, and in it he, he organized and ran two international conferences on the history of recreational mathematics, whose proceedings are included in this journal as well. Have you considered sharing with the world what you have for example, just these things you just mentioned should be translated and issued. Yes, yes, I would like people to do it, yes. All right, but I, I can't do it all myself anymore. No, I know you can't, but, but have people approached you or are you just 
literally waiting for people to approach you. I'm, I'm sort of waiting. I haven't got any, I, at the moment, uh, I, I am getting on. I will be 80 in yes. December. Uh, and I've got these sort of 10 or 11,000 books on recreational mathematics. While the cameras are running, I want you to say that you will bequeath those all to me. No, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> good try. Uh, I think they ought to stay in England because they, many of them have English connections, in particular, yeah. or European ones. Because, I mean, an obvious place would be to try to give them, say, to Indiana to go along with Slocum's stuff. But, yes, uh, that I would do, be very nice, yes. I do slightly feel that they ought to stay in Europe. And unfortunately, the Mathematical Association's library is at the University of Leicester, and Leicester uses a cataloging system which is not compatible with COPAC. Mm -hmm. which is the combined online public access catalog, which you can look up on the internet. So when you do, you can put in a book name and it will tell you each library in England that has it and, uh, in different editions or whatever. And, but since Lester's is incompatible with this, it makes it, I'm nervous about putting the stuff there. Well, send it to Indiana. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Send it to Indiana. Well, it's, it is also, a, it has been a considerable investment, so I would like to see some of it coming back. I, I'd like to sell it to somebody with a really keen well, collector. Like yourself, perhaps. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I am keen. Yeah. The, um, Scholarly efforts uh, of different departments in getting back to the original documents, I understand is a growing phenomenon. Is that my misperception? Because you, you have closer ties with uh, people who work with Incunabula than I do. Yeah. Is yeah. there a growing piece, a growing number of scholars trying to work in this area? Yeah, well, yes, certainly. I'm, there's several things. In, when you want to go back, say, to Chinese or Indian or Arabic mathematics, there's a growing collection of people finding manuscripts and translate, transcribing and translating them into English. Yes. So that's... I mean, I don't read Arabic, I don't read Chinese. Uh, That's the reason you need a society of recreational yes, mathematics. Yes, right, right. So right. those scholars can all come together. Right, right. That's the reason I was saying that. I think there are more of those scholars around today than there was 50 yes, years ago. Yes, well, I mean, the, the things like this meeting, there are more people interested in the history of puzzles and games than there were, in the, say, 50 years ago, I think. Um, but the, um, some of the great people who worked on this, uh, Lu Ka in particular yes. wrote a four volume work on recreational mathematics in which he does a moderate amount of scholarly background trying to explain where these problems had come from. The other person of that era was Wilhelm Ahrens, who's yes. Mathematische Unterhaltungen Spiele is a wonderful source and has a bibliography of getting on to 2,000 items, which is yeah. a lot of stuff. Well, I may have told you in the past that I don't own a copy of Ozanam. Ah. ah. Because they're very expensive and, and no, yes, no yes. good translations exist, or are sold at least. No, no, there are no translations to my knowledge. Oh, wait, oh, wait, no. Hutton, in about 1850, did an English version of it, and that went through about six printings. Okay. So they occasionally turn up. Think about it. The Oxford series of the History of Recreational Mathematics, series editor, David Singmaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We tried that. We didn't get very far, but we did produce seven volumes, which you, some of which are so classic that they're 
highly sought on the internet and Amazon. Um, the book on sliding block puzzles, the book, Rubik's book, the book on jumping um, peg solitaire puzzles. There are classics uh, which I'm very proud to have organized and edited these things. I, we had Coffin's book is on polyhedral dissections. Of, and then he's gone on and done several and, more. And Ep Simon had a Yes, book. yes. And those were sort of problem books, yes. uh, interesting problems. Um, that one, my editor at OUP was a friend of Ap Simon, and he did most of the work in recruiting it and editing it. Um, but at the moment, nobody is from knocking at my door demanding my services for editing another series of books. Well, but except those, were exception, those were exceptional books, but they weren't the history of no, no, no. recreational math. But um, I am just finishing a two-volume book for World Scientific, uh, for Rochelle Kronzek, who yes. you may have met or I've met her. heard. And, um, that will cover its writing, selected writings on recreational mathematics and its history. And so I'm doing some nice historical bits. And I, for example, recently um, worked on the problems of Abbot Albert, which are a 13th century manuscript, which includes the first jugs problem. Wow. And you have eight liters of wine and a jug of five and a jug of three, and you want to divide it in half. Now that, incidentally, is a highly unsolved problem in the can you determine in general uh, whether a problem is doable or not. Now, in the simple case where A equals B plus C and B and C are relatively prime, the, um, there is a, a, the standard method produces a solution in a well-known, easily determined number of steps. But if you ask other questions where the jugs aren't all of uh, relatively prime, but some of them are, you know, you might have two and four, and certain problems are obviously impossible if you have, um, let's see, right, if you have eight liters of wine and you only have containers of two and four, you can't, obviously you can't ever get one mm -hmm. because it's, everything has to be divisible by two. And then there's a very beautiful technique devised in about 1940. The total amount in the jugs is constant. And what you have is three amounts, A plus B plus C, where A, B, and C, where A plus B plus C is always a constant. And these can be graphed in triangular graph paper in yes, the same the, way the as... the bouncing billiard ball problems. And the, right, and the pouring corresponds to a billiard ball bouncing across. And with that, you can examine things and you discover things where the ball bounces around a central region and you can't ever get into the middle or goes around and never gets into the corners. So there are lots of problems of different sorts and some are solvable and some aren't. And Let uh, me try to get us back to being, a fin to being finished, unfortunately. Yes, yes. Now the G4G is on a strong effort. It's going forward. Yes. Krejcik had these conferences back in the 20s. Yes. Have there been other efforts that have failed like well, this? Well, the, um, when Richard Guy bought the Strenz collection, yes. now when you, if you were looking at the Escher exhibition, you will see some book plates for the Strenz, Eugene and Willie Strenz. Yes. That is the collection which Guy acquired for Calgary, and that collection is been expanding. Richard organized an opening conference for it, I think in 1985, yes, because I think I went from London 
to it. They had a conference there afterwards? Yeah, they had an opening conference and we all talked about it. And this was what uh, Lee Dembart uh, remarked, that there used to be puzzle columns and various things. And I talked to him, or I, maybe I said that, and Lee Dembart came back a few weeks later and said they'd like to run a puzzle column in the Los Angeles Times. And, would I and Saul Golem like to contribute? So we ran for a year, maybe. You have so many stories that we could talk all day. Yes, But, but yes, I'm yes. going to have to, uh, to finish. I assume you will continue to be a visitor to G4G. Oh, yes, I love it, I'd say. And we'll all look forward to you in the future. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.